وكفى بالله حسيبا ما كان محمد أبا أحد من رجالكم ولكن رسول الله وخاتم النبي وكان الله بكل شيء عليما اللهم بارك في بلدنا جنوب أفريقيا وعجل روحيا تعلو عاليا أفريقيا أفريقيا بارك Africa, the land of a thousand rising suns and the cradle of life, the ancient continent has long been adored for her natural beauty, but she is equally feared and ostracized for her natural disasters and catastrophes. Africa has always been a tale of two cities. Historians speak eloquently of her tremendous treasures and exotic civilizations, while they also lament the enslavement and subjugation of millions of Africans. Her sun rays bring light to the continent, but her droughts have extinguished just as many lives. Many people recognize her story, but few truly understand her history. She is as old as antiquity itself, and a thousand and one tales emanate from her fertile lands. She is the eye from which the river Nile flows into eternity. She was the birthplace of Moses and the homeland of Hagar. Africa's treasures were sought after by the glorious Roman empires and the Greek dynasties. Athens and Rome fell in love with her natural beauty and Europe ate from her table time and time again. Islam entered Africa long before it entered Jerusalem. It settled in the Horn of Africa before it found its crown and glory in the heart of Al Medina. At a time when Mecca was no longer a safe place for the early Muslim community, the Prophet Muhammad directed his family and followers to Africa. He entrusted no other kingdom and chose no other continent above her. When he explicitly commanded his early followers to seek shelter and find justice in the kingdom of Ethiopia. When we think of Islam in Africa, it is like the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. It was the first destination for Islam's earliest migrants and prisoners of faith. Yet today, it is the last place we think of when we talk of the great fortresses and bastions of Islamic heritage and history. So it is that great lives, like great treasures, are often found in the least likely of places and at the most unexpected of times. But the following story is something quite spectacular. Born in Kuwait in October 1947, Abdul Rahman al-Sumayt had arrived into the world just in time to witness the early stages of Kuwait's mass development and social reforms. Resulting from the first oil fields that were discovered, 
just under a decade before his birth. He was born into a country that was experiencing a huge influx of foreign investment and positive trade from the world's foremost economies such as the United States and the United Kingdom. The citizens of Kuwait were sitting on a gold mine and the quality of life was fast catching up with the standards of living in the western capitals and cities across the oceans. Like many of Kuwait's indigenous population, during the 1950s and 1960s, Abdul Rahman al sumait found new and unprecedented opportunities to pursue studies abroad and to undertake highly academic and intellectual training from renowned institutions. His call to service came earlier than most, and as early as his high school days, Abdul Rahman recalls having witnessed a dramatic and moving scene that took place right outside his school. The event was so profound and disturbing in the heart of the young student that it lit a light inside his soul and fueled the flame of passion in his heart. This single event helped him change the course of his life forever. Abdul Rahman as recalls having seen a group of impoverished manual workers who were desperately looking for a means of transportation while they stood in the merciless heat beneath the Arabian sun each and every day. This humiliating and painful sight stirred up the emotions of Abdul Rahman and his group of friends. And so they decided to combine their pocket money long enough to be able to purchase a second-hand vehicle with which they would drive these workers home each day and they did not charge them a single dime. Abdul Rahman was a caring and very sensitive young man. He pursued medicine and excelled in his field of study, having graduated in 1972 from the University of Baghdad's Faculty of Medicine. Then considered one of the most prestigious institutions in the region. The newly qualified doctor then traveled to the United Kingdom to further his studies, where he graduated two years later with a diploma in the study of tropical diseases from the University of Liverpool. His relentless thirst for medical knowledge continued to occupy his time and effort. He continued to travel and developed his career and academic credentials by taking roles and responsibilities across various medical establishments and institutions until he eventually specialized in the internal medicine and the disease of digestive systems while serving at McGill University in Montreal between July 1974 to December 1978. He then conducted a detailed research into liver cancer while undertaking further training at King's College Hospital, London between January 1979 and December 1980. Now a well-respected and firmly established medical practitioner with recognized qualifications from the most notable institutions and universities in the world, yet he was barely in his mid-thirties. The young professional turned specialist had the world in his palm, like many well-trained and highly educated foreign students. Dr. Abdul Rahman was now eligible to return to his wealthy country and reap the rewards of his sacrifice and hard work. Yet instead of heading for the oil-rich Arab kingdoms, the young doctor turned his attention towards Africa. Charity and voluntary work occupied a special place in the heart of Dr. Abdul Rahman. In fact, even during his student days at university, the young Abdul Rahman was known to have used large portions of his monthly salary 
to fund his regular and routine purchases of Islamic books, all of which he would freely distribute at local mosques. And when his personal finances did not suffice, he readily participated in fundraising activities targeted at fellow students. Together they will use the funds to pay for the printing and distribution of Islamic pamphlets and books throughout Southeast Asia and Africa. But the decisive moment for Dr. Abdul Rahman arrived when he realized the gross and routine negligence directed towards the continent of Africa and her inhabitants. Despite the fact that many of the eastern and western regions within Africa herself were inhabited by Muslim majorities, from Ethiopia to Eritrea, Djibouti, Kenya, Mozambique, Malawi, Zambia and Senegal, among many other nations in the region, the story was always the same. Huge portions of the population were subject to famine, hunger and crippling disease. While the wealthiest nations did very little to alleviate and recognize the misery and suffering. In 1981, Dr. Abdurrahman al then in his mid-thirties, visited the southeastern African nation of Malawi, which was known earlier as Nyasaland. Islam was introduced to Nyasaland about 500 years ago, and more than two-thirds of the population became Muslims. However, the population of Muslims slowly declined until it was only 17% of the total population by the year 1980. And the overwhelming majority of those who remained Muslims hardly knew anything about Islam. This was to be one of his very first visits to the African continent and Dr. Abdurrahman al Sumait took his entire family with him on this amazing journey. Right from the start, the entire family was involved in voluntary and charitable work within the local communities. The weeks turned into months and soon the entire family was engaged in a continuous and profound commitment to helping the local communities by establishing a charitable foundation which they called the Malawi Muslim Agency. It was soon to be renamed Direct Aid Society. As the work became more and more demanding, Dr. Asumet committed more and more of his time and effort towards the local initiatives and projects. This eventually resulted in his resignation from the prestigious medical career that readily awaited him back in Kuwait. From now on, he was going to dedicate his life to the African cause. But, if his determined efforts was winning him some supporters abroad, then his long and frequent journeys to the continent, away from his young family, was slowly beginning to create a drift between him and his relatives. Given the fact that he spent up to 10 months a year working in Africa, it was no surprise when this routine eventually resulted in an estrangement with his family particularly the very young ones, who could not recognize him when he would return home from work. The sacrifice was demanding, and the drive to continue his mission was ingrained in his heart. So in order to reconcile the gaping hole in his domestic relationship, Dr. Asumait decided to start inviting his wife and their five children to spend the entire summer vacation with him in Africa. He did not enroll them into any specific program. Instead, they were allowed to come over and accompany their father on his various projects within the local tribes and villages. The family often traveled on foot, trekking through deserts and set in camp in the open jungle. Those summer holidays felt more like wild adventures and soon the children began to develop a deep love and affinity for Africa. This love grew and blossomed with each trip they made until it became a central part of their identity. When Dr. Asumet's youngest daughter was engaged to her fiancé, she placed one condition 
on his request for her hand in marriage. And that was that her husband-to-be would agree to accompany her to Africa. It was a request which the future husband-to-be accepted. Despite his busy schedule and the importance of his work in Africa, Dr. Abdul Rahman Smait was also a career specialist in the field of medical research. He was a well-respected and established author with several academic books, articles, and titles attributed to his pen. Some of his most notable research papers were in the field of cancer research, as well as detailed studies into the traditions and dialects of local indigenous tribes such as the Dinka, Gabara, Boran, and many more. Dr. Arsumait was dedicated to curing the bodies as well as the heart and the minds. He was especially dedicated towards educating the Muslim tribes in the heartland of rural Africa, many of whom had inherited the religion from their forefathers but possessed little knowledge of the tenets and teachings of Islam. Dr. Asumait argued that if all Muslims paid their duty, which was zakah, there would be no more impoverished Muslims anywhere in the world. He goes on to claim that if the stocks traded in the Muslim world were also zakah taxed, then there would be no more poor people anywhere in the world, Muslim and non-Muslim alike. In brief, he was a champion for poverty relief and humanitarian development, but he focused his efforts on the Muslim governments and establishments, and never towards the UN and Western institutions. Throughout the course of his three decades in Africa, Dr. Abdul Rahman suffered many ailments and maladies, out in the dense jungles and villages, while working to assist the local communities and towards spreading the message of true Islam to the farthest and most remote villages and dwellings. He took numerous trips deep into the African jungle in order to conduct his work, but he subsequently developed a high blood pressure, diabetes, and even contracted a number of blood clots and malaria, among other diseases. Yet for his bravery and relentless service to the African people, Dr. Abdul Rahman al Sumait was the target of several failed assassination attempts. He recounts having been shot several times and even escaped the explosive force of a landmine that blew up beneath his feet during the civil war in Mozambique. Similar reports were also recounted of his time in Somalia during the civil war in the early 1990s. On one such occasion, Dr. Abdul Rahman was reportedly targeted by gunmen and went on to receive many death threats throughout the decades he spent working in Africa. Yet despite the continuous hostilities and life-threatening situations, Dr. Abdul Rahman al sumait continued to call people to Islam and developed communities in over 29 African countries. Indeed, few are they who have worked so relentlessly and sincerely for the honor and dignity of human life without the need to publicize and promote their brilliant work by boasting and broadcasting their achievements to the entire world. Dr. Abdul Rahman al sumait is perhaps the least celebrated dawah carrier and humanitarian champion of the 21st century. Some of his achievements over the 29 years include the following. Direct aid was responsible for the housing, clothing, education and sponsorship of over 9,500 orphans. His organization also financed 95,000 students and saw them through to secondary and higher education many of whom came from very deprived backgrounds. The organization trained 200 women, built 860 schools, established four universities, and dug 9,500 wells in the most remote villages and communities, thereby securing safe drinking water for the deprived communities there. Dr. Abdul Rahman also stressed the importance of Islamic culture and education. He also identified the Islamic Muslim communities as his brethren in faith and towards realizing the goals of elevating the native people materially, intellectually and also spiritually, he built schools and universities 
alongside institutions of Islamic culture and development. This included 5,700 mosques and 102 Islamic centers. Moreover, during his long career in the African Dawah, his organization was able to sponsor and distribute over 50 million copies of the glorious Quran. This resulted in over 5 million conversions, including priests and bishops in Africa. His charitable mission and Dawah work covered 29 African countries and touched the hearts, minds and souls of millions of indigenous people on the continent. His was a life full of adventure and achievement. He escaped the clutches of death several times and suffered imprisonment and torture twice at the hands of the Iraqi military services. He survived many illnesses and suffered the hunger, thirst and sleeplessness that afflicted him on his long and solitary mission to deliver the message of Islam back to Africa and to help alleviate the suffering and poverty present in most deprived villages and communities on the continent. Dr. Abdurrahman was a founder of many institutions and he chaired many medical foundations and think tanks in the Muslim world, as well as some of the highly ranked institutions in the Western Hemisphere. Yet despite his long list of awards, merit, certificates, and honorary degrees and doctorates from all over the world, including the prestigious King Faisal International Prize for Service in Islam. Dr. Abdul Rahman al Sumait remained level headed and consistent in his work and mission. Dr. Abdul Rahman al Sumait died in 2013. He returned to his creator after having traveled to Germany in search for medical attention as his health problems became more and more serious. <coughs> On August 15, 2013, Dr. Abdul Rahman al sumais death was announced. He died from a complicated heart condition. May Allah grant Dr. Abdul Rahman a beautiful recompense for his sacrifice and spread his message to the coming generations. May his legacy shine bright before those who hope to follow in the footsteps of Muhammad wasallam, towards delivering humanity from darkness into light with assistance, education, love and dignity. Ameen. Allahumma ya shafi wa ya mu'afi ishfi shaykhana abdurrahman al-sumayn